All right, well, hey, let's let's jump in. If you have your Bibles, then you can turn with me to uh, Luke chapter 9. Luke chapter 9. This morning, uh, I will be preaching Jesus Christ from Luke chapter 9, verses 46 through to 48. Luke chapter 9, verses 46 through to 48. Now, it kind of surprised me, but we have been in Luke for a year, almost. Our first one was at the end of last May, and, and we're only in Luke 9. But my hope was that we would actually uh, split it up. So as I've been saying for the last, I don't know, six months or so, that our plan was only to go to Luke chapter 9, verse 50, because that sort of uh, denotes the Galilean ministry of Jesus. So from his birth to uh, him doing his public ministry in and around the area of Galilee. In, in Luke chapter 9, verse 50, if you have your Bibles open, you can see there uh, that he says, it says, when the days drew near for him to be taken up, he set his face to go to Jerusalem. And from that point on, he goes uh, to Jerusalem on his way to the, on his way to the cross. So we will pick up Luke chapter part 2 uh, another time. Uh, we are going to stop here. This will be the last sermon uh, for the first part of, of Luke uh, part 1. All right? Does that make sense? Okay, I just want to make sure that we all, we all knew that. At all times, in every circumstance, amidst all trials, we have to remember this one thing, that the church is on mission. It's so important that we understand that as Christians, we are not saved to sit. <laughs> We're not saved by Jesus to be able to sit and be like, oh, good, I got Jesus, I'm comfy, I'm going to heaven, uh, this is nice, you know, or I'm not saved to gather. Well, I'm not just saved to come to a church and be like, oh, this is a nice community in the sun and and that's great. Like, I love the community and the potlucks and all that kind of stuff, even though we can't have that uh, right now. We are not saved to sit. We are not saved to gather. We are saved to go. If you like alliteration, you are saved to scatter. You are saved for a mission. You are saved to go on mission. The church, as you know, ecclesia is the word in Greek, means assembly. It means the gathering, the physical assembly, the physical gathering. The church is literally the gathering or assembly of individual saints, of Christians, of holy ones. Lots of people say, oh, I'm not a saint, I'm not a saint. And I understand what they're saying. They're saying, like, I don't want you to look at me as holy, but this is the way that God wants us to see ourselves as the church. We are all saints. Paul calls the churches, they're saints. Saints in Corinth, part of the churches. We are the set-apart holy ones. There's the one global church, and there are multiple local churches which are all part of the universal assembly, past, present, and future. And this church, which includes, believe it or not, North Valley, all of us here, is the body of Christ. Now, there are many metaphors of what the church is in Scripture, right? The bride of Christ, the vine, and so on and so forth. But I want us to look and focus on this one of the body of Christ. We are the body of Christ. Think of a human body, okay? Think of yourself right now. You are a, a body. The church is that, and the head of that body is Jesus. We are all parts of this one body get, receiving our source from the head, which is Jesus Christ. And we are existing to accomplish the tasks he set us out to do. We are, we are not our own. We are part of a body with Christ as the head. And Jesus, as we've seen through our study of Luke so far, he is on mission. If we're the body of Christ, then we are part of a, a body that is on mission. Jesus is always on mission. He doesn't just, you know, dink around in Nazareth and Galilee. He's like, oh, what should I do today? Maybe I'll go to the beach. Like, that's not what Jesus does. He's always on mission. He's always listening to his Father and only saying what his Father says. He's always looking to his Father and only doing as his Father says. And yes, yeah, so I think this is important that we have to understand that he is still on mission. Even though he has ascended to heaven and he's sitting at the right hand of the throne of God, he is still on mission through us. We know Paul. Before he was Paul, he was Saul, right? He was the persecutor of the Christians. And, and I love it on the way to Damascus Road. And, and Jesus shows up as this big light. And Jesus, what does Jesus say? I think it's so profound. He says, why are you persecuting me? So as Paul, as Saul is, is, is hurting the individual people in the church, taking them, ripping them out of their homes and throwing them into jail, laying his, his sort of approval to have them killed and martyred, Jesus says, you are persecuting me because Jesus identifies as his body, as the church. So that means that Jesus is still on mission today through his church, which is so, so important. And yes, I want to make sure that we know that he, he visits Muslims in visions today. I just... 
heard a report from January, I think I mentioned this, of a, a woman in, I think it was Ethiopia, who was uh, from a Muslim home, and in her morning prayers to Allah, uh, Jesus showed up in a vision, and he was on a river, and he, took, he, he gave out his hand and said, you are mine, you are my daughter. And she had a neighbor who was a Christian, she went over there, and they ended up praying with one another, and then her Muslim husband found out and beat her. It's a terrible story, but it was amazing to see that Jesus showed up and he saved her. And she will suffer for being a Christian, and we all will suffer for being a Christian. But Jesus does do those things. He does that. He'll show up in visions. Yes, he does. But, I want to say this, but he primarily visits the world's lost and broken through his body, the church. North Valley, we are not exempt from this. We are either part of his body or we are not. And as his body, receiving our life and our joy and our strength from him, we are, as the Apostle Peter writes, a chosen race. Now, that's a very... Uh, you know, uh, relevant term today, but obviously we know this is not a meaning of physical race, this is a spiritual race. We are a chosen spiritual race. We are a royal priesthood. We are a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, not just to sit, but for a purpose, so that we may proclaim the excellencies of him who called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. First Peter 2, 9. If you want a, 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 a verse for life, that's a great verse. We are this holy nation for the purpose. I am a chosen priest for the purpose to proclaim the excellencies of God. Now, what is our mission? Our mission as the church, the body of Christ, is just that. To proclaim the excellencies, the glory, the salvation, the goodness, and the love of God to the world. Our mission is to, to spread ourselves out, covering the whole world where people are. Even the, the Sentinelese people that Monique talked about this morning. This little tiny island, and you're not allowed to go there. Right, because the Indian government says you cannot go there because if you do, you'll probably bring a, a flu and you'll you'll kill them all because they've been there for years and years and years and years. Our role is to to spread ourselves out to share the love of Christ to all people and to all people groups. And upon them receiving Jesus, we're to train them to be students of Jesus, disciples and followers of Him. This is who we are. We are the ones who God has lovingly and powerfully called out of darkness into his marvelous light. We are loved more than we know. We are loved more than we know. God rejoices and sings when one person repents and enters into his family by faith. We are so loved by God, but we are also called by God. Called to identify with the chosen spiritual race of the church and not the spiritually harmful race of the world. Called as royal priests before God to offer ourselves to him as our spiritual act of worship and not to offer ourselves or the members of our bodies, to the world. Called to live set-apart lives for him in unity with our spiritual family and not to live in harmony with the world. Called to live as though we are God's own possession and not our own possession or the world's own possession. And called to proclaim his wonderful work to the ends of the earth. At all times, in every circumstance, amidst all trials, we as the church are on mission. We are the called out ones, empowered by God's spirit to love God with our everything and to love others by showing them his great love for them. And the way that we, we, we show his love for them is ultimately by pointing them to Jesus and the work that he did in the gospel. And that is the peak of all of God's excellencies. The Apostle John wrote this, in this is love. You want to know love? This is it. Not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son Jesus to be the saving sacrifice, the atoning sacrifice for our sins. That is the love of God that we are to share with the world as the church of Christ, the body of Christ. Now, I, I begin this way, reminding ourselves of our mission as the church, firstly because it's so important. In North America, the, 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 the mindset is that Christianity is something that we add into our lives to help us live our lives. <laughs> so it's sort of used as a consumeristic thing right? I'll worship Jesus because he helps me accomplish my dreams. But that's not what it is at all. We have to remember that to be a Christian is to actually deny yourself completely. It's to give up your dreams and your ambitions and to pick up your cross and follow Jesus on the mission that he has sent us on. So it's so important that we regularly remind ourselves of the fact that we are on mission as the church. We are so forgetful people. We are Israel saved from Egypt and then within a few days saying, I want to go back. I want to go back. I don't want to be here anymore, right? That's us, right? But secondly, I want to begin this way because studying and reflecting and meditating on any text 
from the Bible, separately from our mission, is ultimately pointless. God has given us his word, his very own voice of power and truth today to assist us in our mission as disciples of Jesus, to empower us. So I want to challenge all of us today to not only continue the mission as the church, both with North Valley or your respective local churches, and also individually, but also to contemplate this text that we are in today in a mission-oriented way. Because if we don't, then it's not really going to do much. But if we look at it as, okay, how is this going to help me accomplish the mission that Jesus has sent me on, it will actually affect us. Now with our text this morning, God, through Luke, he provides us with an example from Jesus and the disciples that caution us, cautions us of a temptation that can arise when we seek to accomplish our mission as the church. And that temptation is pride. Pride. As many of you know, our journey in Luke for the past few weeks has brought us up the mountain, right, to see Jesus transfigured. We heard about his departure in Jerusalem with Moses and Elijah. We heard God himself, the God the Father, tell the few disciples to listen to Jesus. We then, we walked down the mountain uh, of glory with Jesus into the valley of pain and, and brokenness and demons. We saw the heart of God in Jesus as Jesus was exasperated by the sin and brokenness of the world. But we also saw the great compassion and power of God as Jesus healed this poor boy who was demonized and suffered terribly from many physical issues. And then he reunited him with his father. We also then heard the odd words of Jesus, the great deliverer and king, who... His mission is to redeem and restore the world, and we heard that this great deliverer was going to be delivered into the hands of men. His disciples didn't understand that, but he warned them that something revolutionary was about to happen. And it's after Jesus speaks these difficult and these hard words that Luke records our passage. So right after, get this, right after Jesus looks at his disciples and says, I as the king, I as the great one that you all look to as the king and the messiah, I'm going to willingly be betrayed into the hands of men. Right after this, we get our passage. Verse, verse 46. An argument arose among them. Classic humanity. <laughs> An argument arose among them as to which of them was the greatest. But Jesus, knowing the reasoning of their hearts, took a child and put him by his side and said to them, Whoever receives this child in my name, receives me, and whoever receives me receives him who sent me. For he who is least among you all is the one who is great. So here in this passage, we read of a temptation we can face as we seek to accomplish our mission as the body of Christ, our mission to proclaim God's excellencies and goodness and love to the world. There is going to be the temptation, and it's already affected most of us, to pride ourselves in our personal greatness and worthiness within the body of Christ and the church. Jesus saw this in his own disciples, and he provided the key out of it. And that is this. We are to counteract pride by humbly ministering to the lowly on behalf of Jesus. We are to counteract pride by humbly ministering to the lowly on behalf of Jesus. If you look at verse 46, we read this. An argument arose among them as to which of them was the greatest. Now, their idea of greatness is the same as much of the world's idea of greatness today, right? First place was greatness. Being served was greatness. Being picked first was greatness. Being the leader, that is greatness. And their thoughts weren't about just their greatness in the world generally, but in their mission as Jesus' disciples. In Matthew's version of this account, the disciples came and asked Jesus, who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? So they are thinking in terms of the kingdom of the restored kingdom that God has given to the world through Jesus. So here are the disciples arguing about which of them was the greatest in the church, so to speak. You can imagine Peter saying, well, guys, you know, he, he did say he would build his church on me. So that, that's got to say something, right? And then John maybe pipes in and says, that's true, Peter, but, you know, Jesus calls me his beloved. He says that I'm the one that he really loves, so he really loves me. And that means I'm pretty, must be pretty great. Right? And then Nathaniel might come in and say, okay, I, I get it, you guys are right, but when Jesus first met me, I don't remember this, Peter, John, but when Jesus first met me, he said there was no deceit in me. There's no deceit in me. There's no deceit in me. 
right? So I must be, I must be pretty, pretty great. That says something. And then James might come in and say, true, Nathaniel, but did Jesus ask you to come up on the mountain with me? No, no, he did. He asked me, Peter, and John to go up on the mountain of transfiguration, not you. He, you had to stay below here in the, in the brokenness. So I was only three to go up. So I think he sees something in me. So you get an idea, right? They were arguing about who was the greatest among them. Who is going to be the leader? Who is who is going to be the the you could say the the right hand man in the kingdom of God? You see, in their eyes, Jesus as the Messiah, as the King, he was going to establish his political rule very very soon. There's waiting, like Jesus, come on. Pretty soon you're going to overthrow the Romans. We're going to set up your throne, and we're going to be your twelve. You know, we're going to sit on twelve thrones, and we're going to rule with you, right? And, but who's going to be the right hand man, right? So they're they're waiting for this. And don't we do this too, in such a variety of ways? We do this too. Don't we sometimes, maybe often, reason in our hearts and maybe even argue out loud about our worth, our prestige as God's gift to the church? You know, I might think, well, I'm pastor. In fact, call me reverend, canon, bishop, begna, right? So God obviously thought I had something important to give to the church. Or maybe someone might think, well, all those, you know, clean-cut Baptists who never get their hands dirty in the ministry of the real hurting world on the streets, do they really know God's love? I know God's love. I'm down there, but all those clean-cut Baptists, they just sit in their nice church. They don't really know God's love. I'm, I think I'm, I'm greater. I think I get it more than, more than they do. Or maybe some people might think, you know, I know more theology than all the, the church leaders and mission combined. I get it. I understand the plan of God. When they use that word justification, they don't really know what they're talking about. When they say that God loves everybody, well, he doesn't really love everybody. He loves his elect and the blue, all this stuff, right? So I, I'm great. I really get it. Or maybe someone says, yeah, I seem to be the only one evangelizing this town of mission. No one else does. Whenever I ask people, hey, who do you share the gospel with this week? They always look at me with a dumb stare. I'm great because I at least care for mission. Or maybe someone thinks, I feel like I'm the only one that experiences true intimacy with Jesus. Every other Christian I talk to, they, they don't experience a, a time of true intimacy with Jesus. I must be special. God must really think I'm great to give me this real deep intimacy with Jesus. See, we can let pride, in such a variety of ways, we can let sort of pride rise up in our hearts as we reason in our hearts about our personal greatness, our personal worth as Christians in the body of Christ. Another way this pride may show itself is less about thinking that you're the greatest among the Christians, but that you're simply great enough. In other words, I'm good where I am. I, I'm, I come to church. I tithe. I, I do some good deeds. I, I support this and that ministry. I'm, I'm great enough. That's also pride. You're not thinking you're better than others necessarily, but you're priding yourself in your greatness that's apparently good enough for God. Now look at verse, look at verse 47. Verse 47, but Jesus knowing the reasoning of their hearts, took a child and put him by his side. Now, that but at the beginning of the verse is literally in the Greek text. Okay, This goes to show that Luke is making the point that Jesus, knowing the argument and reasoning of their hearts as to who is the greatest, he's going to make contrast. He's like, yeah, I see that, but here's the truth. There is something wrong about their discussion, and Jesus is about to respond to it. And before he speaks, he takes, I love this, he takes a young boy and he puts him at his side. Now in Mark's account of the same event, he takes him into his arms. Now the boy is probably three to eight years old, something like that. And for the sake of making the story really kind of real and personal, it could be that this boy was none other than one of Peter's boys. Again, in Mark's account, we learn that they were in Capernaum in the house when this happened. They weren't just in the market where kids might be you know, running around. So unless one of the other disciples brought their boy with them on this trip, then this boy was probably Peter's boy. And Jesus takes this boy, maybe Peter's son, and places him right there next to him as his kind of his right-hand man. Now, before we look at what Jesus says, we need to briefly understand how children were viewed in Jesus' day. Children, although loved and provided for by their parents, were sort of viewed as powerless in society and dependent people. They were needy, and they were often overlooked. Also, children under 12 wouldn't be able to study the Torah at this point. So in a Jewish mind, what's the point of talking with a kid who's never studied the Torah? No point in that. One Jewish saying is actually quite telling of how children are viewed. I love this. Listen to this. This is a quote from a rabbi. Quote, morning sleep. 
midday wine, chattering with children, and tarrying in places where men of the common people assemble, destroy a man. <laughs> Let me say that again. Morning sleep destroys a man. Midday wine destroys a man. Chattering with children destroys a man. And hanging out with the common commoners. Those are, all those things are just will destroy you. <laughs> I love it. Um, out of the four things that apparently destroy someone, chattering with children is one of them. So in general, you got to understand, children, at least under 12, were generally considered valueless in the society's eyes. We even see this in Jesus' own disciples later in Luke 18. People were coming with their children to have Jesus bless them. And his disciples rebuked them. They said, stop bringing your kids to the teacher. You don't have time for those little, those little irrational, overly emotional kids. Right? We don't got time for them, but in turn, Jesus rebuked the disciples. I love it. All this to say, we see the disciples arguing about which of them is the greatest, and then Jesus responds first by taking a child who is considered not great in their estimation, and he puts him at his side as his right-hand man. In our world today, children have been given much more value, which is great. But if Jesus was doing the same object lesson to us today, he might put someone else by his side. Maybe he would put someone who is maybe homeless. Maybe he would put someone who is very addicted to drugs. He would put someone that is viewed amongst most in our culture as, quote-unquote, not great by his side. Someone lowly, someone dependent, someone needy. Someone often looked at as kind of despised in culture's eyes. This is what he did in, to the disciples by placing a child by him. And then he speaks. Look at verse 48 again. And he said to them, Whoever receives this child in my name receives me, and whoever receives me receives him who sent me. For he who is least among you all is the one who is great. Jesus here is speaking of ministry to the lowly, to the not greats in the culture's understanding. One of the key words in this verse is obviously receive, right? Four times, which might be translated welcomes in your translation or accepts. It's a ministry term. It's the opposite. To receive someone is the opposite of overlooking that person, of sidestepping that person, ignoring that person. Just like when the, when the priest went on the other side of the road to pass the Samaritan who was injured, right? It's, it's the opposite of that. To receive someone is to genuinely bring them into your space, your precious space. Man, as North Americans in this cold climate culture, we love our space. We value our space, physically and Relation or personally, right? We really value it. To receive someone is to break that and bring someone in to show them kindness and hospitality. In Luke chapter 15, verse 2, Jesus is accused by the Pharisees of receiving, same word, receiving sinners and eating with them. Oh, how dare Jesus to eat, share a table with sinners. To receive is to get down on the same level with other people and participate with them in a close and personal way. To receive someone is not just to give money to someone for food, but to invite them over to sit at your table and eat with them and hear their story. Outside, of course. Can't have them inside. But that's what it is. But this receiving, as you can see, is not just sort of general. It's receiving in Jesus' name. Jesus is talking about welcoming and getting down at the same level as a child, someone who's not considered great, and welcoming them on behalf of Jesus as his representative. So Jesus is talking about ministry here. It's a personal connection with a lowly person for Jesus, for the advancement of the cause and ministry of Jesus. It's, it's showing not your kindness and compassion towards a lowly person, but the kindness and compassion of Jesus through you to that person, so that that lowly person would see Jesus and glorify him. Not they would see your greatness and be like, you are amazing, but to see Jesus and glorify Jesus. That's ministry. Jesus is not talking about us personally just showing kindness to people, period. Lots of people show kindness to people every day. Jesus here is talking about receiving someone in love on his behalf for him. Now, Jesus is saying that when the disciples do this, when they receive lowly children or anyone needy and lowly in their culture, when they do that in his name, then they receive himself. They receive Jesus. And then in turn, God the Father. You see, Jesus relates so much to the lowly, to the broken, to the despised 
and to the valueless. He walked the path of shame and humiliation like so many lowly people on this earth. He never took hold of what the culture deemed as great. He never ran to be first in line. He never did. He was never saying, I'm going to be the strongest. I'm going to be the best. I'm going to, I'm going to basically become the one that everyone wants to pick first. Rather, he clothed himself in humility and lowliness. We read in John's Gospel that he even went around and washed the dirty feet of his disciples. Something that a lowly servant would do. And just like a not great leper at the time who repelled people from themselves, nobody wanted to associate with them or touch them. Like, get out. Get, out, get, outside, the, get outside the city. Just like a leper, Jesus himself was abandoned by even his closest followers who didn't want to associate with him or touch him at his greatest time of need. As someone who humbled himself to the point of shamefully dying on a cruel Roman cross reserved for those who did treason and people that were not Jewish, he understood the lowly, the broken, the shamed, and the outcasts. Pardon me, someone who wasn't Roman, I should say. When a disciple welcomes a lowly child in Jesus' name, they welcome Jesus himself because Jesus so identifies with the lowly, with the sick, with the poor, and the broken. Now, it's not that every, this is very important, it's not that every lowly, needy, poor, and not great person in each culture somehow is Jesus in some mystical sense, so that when you love them, you literally are loving Jesus because Jesus is somehow in them. I think Jesus is speaking of more of a general spiritual reality here. To put it simply, when we welcome and show personal kindness to the lowly and the hurting in our society, and not just throw some money at them, but actually receive them. Get down their level. Share table with them. When we do that in Jesus' name, that is for the purpose of ministering to them, to show the love of Jesus to them, Jesus is happy. I think that's kind of the main, most simplest point. Jesus is happy. In a sense, Jesus feels our kindness upon himself when we show his kindness to others. And when he feels that receiving in our ministry of compassion to the lowly in the world, we also bless God the Father, the one who sent Jesus to show the very same kindness to us. We are reflecting the compassion of God when we show compassion to the lowly. God the Father himself is blessed. He is happy when he feels the love of his Son flowing through a person, benefiting someone else, particularly someone who is lowly and needy. Many of you have... Uh, children, and you have experienced them fulfilling something or doing something well. I was actually just talking to uh, Richard over here, uh, Jeru, and he was just telling me about something he's very proud of in his kids, and it's their work ethic. Um, I'm sure he's okay with me saying that, because it's a good thing, right? And it's amazing, as a parent, when your child shows something that's honorable and good to someone else, in a sense, they not only receive the blessing, but Richard also receives the blessing. You know what I mean? So there's a sort of like this thing, or Tanya, I'm sure that when your kids have won something, it's like you're also glorified and Jeremy is glorified because there's something that kind of goes on. Or one of my favorites, I have a friend who when uh, Adoniram was born and Brittany went through horrendous 17-hour labor, just terrible, terrible, just so much, and we posted this picture of Adoniram saying, he's born! One of my dad's friends said, well done, Eugene. And we just laughed, like, Eugene, what did Eugene do? He didn't suffer 17 hours of labor. He was content sitting there at home watching the game, probably. Um, Brittany's the one. But it, what, what he was doing was like, well done, Eugene, because through Eugene, this came about, right? Through Eugene, you know, sorry, blah, 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 blah. The point is there is this trajectory that sort of happens through this reception of the... Does that kind of make sense a little bit? Somewhat, some way? Okay, that's, that's good. All right, Jesus then gives this principle. The end of verse 48, and we're going to wrap up here pretty quick here. The end of verse 48. For he who is least among you all is the one who is great. Now it seems like Jesus here is saying that the least are those in culture who are deemed as lowly, like humble children and servants, the needy. Jesus is helping disciples understand that true greatness is not about striving for honor and prestige and being served and barking orders, but instead is about humility and service. In Matthew's version of this same account, Jesus' point is very direct. He's like, be like a humble child. 
and you will enter the kingdom of heaven. You will be great. Later in Luke's gospel, the disciples will argue again about who is greatest. The disciples just did not seem to get it, but we're no better than that. We need to be reminded constantly. Later in Luke chapter 22, verse 27, uh, Jesus says this, The kings of the Gentiles, they exercise lordship over the Gentiles, and those in authority over them are called benefactors, but not so with you. Rather, let the greatest among you become as the youngest, and the leader as the one who serves. For who is greater, the one who reclines at table or one who serves? Is it not the one who reclines at table? Yes, it is. That's In the world's terms, yes. The one who's just sitting on the table being served, that's the great one. In the world's terms, Jesus says this, though. But I am among you as the one who serves. I love that. Do you see what Jesus just did there? They all know that he's the greatest. He's the king. He's the Messiah. And yet he's the one serving. He washes feet. He associates with the sinners, the lepers, the children, and the prostitutes. He did not come to be served as some earthly king, but to serve as a lowly servant. Therefore, if they want to be great like Jesus, then they need to become as the youngest and as the one who serves. They need to become like the child, as the servant. They need to assume the last place in line. In other words, they need to become dependent and unworthy in their eyes and in their ministry. And they need to become a servant in their ministry. Because when they do, they will then be looking more like Jesus and therefore truly great. So Jesus here was responding to his disciples' pride and their argument of, you know, who is the greatest? By saying something like this, here's a paraphrase. True greatness is found in humility, in the humility and service and dependability of those who are the least, like children and servants and like me, who serves you in the power of the Spirit. Therefore, in humility, disciples, serve the lowly and despised and serve them for me on my behalf to continue my ministry. And when you do, you will bless me and my Father because our love is being displayed through you. You see, church, greatness is not about reclining at the best place at the table and having grapes lowered in your mouth. It's also not about how much you know or how much you do. True greatness church is found in the humble service of the lowly so that the kindness and compassion of Jesus is displayed so we are to counteract pride in our ministry by humbly ministering to the lowly on behalf of Jesus in Titus 2 verse 13 we read of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ Jesus truly is the great God he is the greatest. None surpass him. He is the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. No one passes him in rank or worth or greatness. He is preeminent and superior over all. He is the great God. And this great God is our example of greatness. In Mark chapter 10, verse 45, and speaking of greatness to his disciples, Jesus says this, The Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. The whole life of Jesus is marked by humble, dependent service. This is because God is a servant God. God is our helper. In Genesis chapter 2, when the man was not going to be alone, so God created a helper for him. Some people look at that and be like, yes, okay, all women are to be helpers for the men. Did you know that that word helper, ezer, is used for God? God is our helper. That should elevate women very, very much so. That they are akin to God in that sense, to be our helper. God is the one that we are to wait on. God is our, the one that serves us. Oftentimes I hear Christians say, I want to serve God more, serve God more. I, under, I understand their heart, but we are, the one that are, we are the ones that are served by God. God is a servant God. He sees us in our sin, our plight, our brokenness, and he serves us loving salvation. Jesus demonstrated the heart of God, our servant, God, our helper. God our easer by never assuming earthly kingship on earth and never abusing his godness to promote himself. He served, if you read through the Gospels, he served as quietly as he could. He would heal and say, don't tell anybody about this. He served as quietly as he could. And his service was to the needy, the poor, the destitute, those who knew they were in need and reached out to him. But his ultimate service was to the whole world, 
who spiritually speaking are all poor, all needy, all destitute because of their sin. From the lowest child to the servant to Caesar himself and Herod, all are lonely and weak and needy. And he served us, Jesus served us not as a domineering ruler, but as a gentle and meek servant. We could say that the gospel, which is Jesus' life, death, and resurrection, it is the greatest act of receiving the lowly, of welcoming, accept, accepting, and getting on our level and connecting with us intimately. He didn't just throw a ransom at us. He wasn't in heaven and said, here, take some of this and be saved. He came down. He came down and shared table with us in our world. Our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, is the God of service and kindness to the lowly. How do we know? Because he welcomes us rebels and sinners into his Father's home, providing all that's needed for us to live forever with him. Therefore, church, as we strive to accomplish our mission to proclaim the goodness of God, the excellencies of God to the whole world, we are not to puff ourselves up in pride, assuming a kind of greatness in ourselves among the church, thinking that if we die, the church is in trouble. Neither are we to be proud in our good enough greatness that we believe just sort of gets us by. I'm great. I'm good. Rather, we are to model ourselves after Jesus. In humility, we are to serve the needy, the broken, and the least by welcoming them in Jesus' name, on his behalf, showing them the great love of Jesus. We are not to seek a greatness that's described by the world, a greatness marked by honor, of knowledge, sitting on a throne, but a greatness marked, marked by humility, of dependability and service. We are to remain humble as those who are nothing in and of ourselves. We are to remain dependable on Jesus, dependent on Jesus, the source of our life, our head. And we are to remain servants, sharing the love of Jesus in word and deed across this globe to all people, showing no partiality, showing love to the CEOs, showing love to the homeless, especially the lowly and despised and needy. As the church on mission, recognizing Jesus' service to us as the head to our body, we are to now serve the broken and needy world in humility, continuing his ministry. And when that temptation comes into our hearts and our minds to pride ourselves in how great we are in the church or how great enough we might be, we need to counteract that pride by humbly ministering, receiving the lowly on behalf of Jesus. Father in heaven, we thank you for this word. We thank you, Lord, that you took this child and placed him as your right-hand man in so many ways to show not only do we, do we need to become like this child in, in, humble, in humility, but we are to, just like Jesus did, Come and receive, receive the lowly like this child. Receive those that culture might say, oh my goodness, we have no time for them, right? We need to receive those, the not greats. And ultimately, Lord, we need to all understand that none of us are great. We are all the not greats. We are all the destitutes. We are all the outcasts. No matter how much we have, how much we don't have, whatever. And we need to recognize that you, Jesus, being the servant of all, came and you saved us from our plight. You saved us from our sin. You saved us from hell. And you brought us to yourself. So, Lord, may we now, as a church, reject and counteract any pride that may arise in our hearts, thinking that we're something that we're really not. And may we continue to serve the lowly and the despised of this world for your sake, for your sake, in your power. In Jesus' name, amen.